highlights of 1951. Hi, football fans. This is Harry Wood inviting you to enjoy life with Miller High Life and ready to escort you to a 50-yard line seat for all the action-packed highlights of your favorite Major League football team in action during the thrilling 1951 season. Ball at its finest, with all the star-studded action of your own favorite team passing on parade. Brought your way by Miller High Life, the one Milwaukee beer that is supporting Major League football. At Forbes Field on Monday night, the New York football giants opened their campaigns, the ever-dangerous Pittsburgh Steelers. And the Steelers, led by Joe Gary, the one-man gang, offered the New Yorkers a rough reception. Early in the first quarter, Joe Gary punts from his own 22. Safety man Jim Ostendorf is on the receiving end and with no hesitation whatsoever proceeds to gallop 52 yards through the entire Steeler defense before being brought down on the Pittsburgh 22. The Steeler defense holds for three downs inside the 10 and Ray Poole attempts a field goal for the Giants. It's good and the New Yorkers lead the Steelers three to nothing. Parked by Joe Gary, the Steelers swing into action. Joe goes back to pass from his 37. It's a high long one to Lynn Chadnoise, who finally comes to rest on the New York 23. This time the Giants hold firm and Joe Gary duplicates the New York score with a 24 yard field goal of his own. Giants three, Steelers three. In the second quarter, it's that man Gary again, this time crossing up the Giants with a quick kick that covers 45 yards to the New York 44. On the next play, Travis Tidwell goes back to throw for the Giants. He fakes once and then lets fly a towering pass that Joe Scott grabs and carries into the end zone for a tie-breaking touchdown as the New Yorkers take the lead 10 to 3. Kyle Rope kicks off for the Giants. Unfortunately for them, the Steelers' Joe Gary happens to be under it. With perfect blocking all the way, Joe sprints 86 yards to the New York two before being colored by a desperate giant. Three plays later, Gary himself completes the journey on one bounce as he goes through the middle for a Steeler touchdown. None other than Joey boots the extra point to make the halftime score Steelers 10, Giants 10. In the third quarter, Gary climaxes his one-man show by booting a second field goal to put the Steelers on top again, 13 to 10. But the joy of the Pittsburgh fans is short-lived. Gary fades to pass from the Giant 48. He throws and the Giant Schellenbacher snatches the pigskin and races back to the Steeler 45 before going out of bounds. Quarterback Tidwell wastes no time. He hands off to Kyle Roth and the former SMU Flash comes down the near sideline and bolts for 31 yards to the Steeler 14. The Steeler line holds and Ray Poole is called on for a field goal. It's good and the underdog Steelers have to be satisfied with a 13-13 tie in their league opener with the New York football Giants. One of the most rousing pro battles of the week took place in Milwaukee where the Green Bay Packers and the Pittsburgh Steelers met on a muddy field and put on a high scoring exhibition that left the crowd breathless. With the first quarter barely underway, Tobin Roth touches off a Green Bay drive as he romps around left end for 28 yards to the Pittsburgh 38. Two plays later, a huge hole opens up for Jack Cloud and he dashes into the Steelers' secondary for 11 yards down to the 24. 
Then it's Billy Grimes racing off tackle and into the end zone to score first for Green Bay. The conversion is good and it's Packers seven, Steelers nothing. The next time they get the ball, the Green Bay Packers repeat, this time through the air. Tobin wrote pitches. Bob Mann juggles the ball and then settles down to some serious running to wind up on the touchdown side of the goal with a hop, skip, and a jump. Green Bay Packers 14, Pittsburgh Steelers nothing. Still in the first quarter, it's the Steelers' ball on their own 20. Gary goes back to pass, lets it fly with the long arms of Ace Loomis. Reach up to intercept, and Loomis turns in a brilliant twisting run as he comes back to the Steeler 26. The Packers waste no time in taking advantage of the opportunity. Tobin wrote, arches a 20-yard aerial into the end zone and the capable hands of Ray Palfrey for the third Packer touchdown. With minutes yet to run in the first quarter, score now, Packers 21, Steelers nothing. As the quarter runs out, Gary goes back to punt for the Steelers from his own 28. The ball is off the side of his foot, goes out of bounds just five yards up the field on the 33 to put Green Bay in scoring position again. And a quick opening, Tony Cannadale blasts over guard for 15 yards to the Steeler, 18. On the first play of the second quarter, a Tobin Road pass hits Carl Elliott for nine yards to the Pittsburgh 10. Then four plays later, Road sneaks across to make it Green Bay 28, Pittsburgh nothing. Now the Steeler offense begins to roll. From his own 45, Lynn Shadnoy of Michigan State goes back and heaves out to Chuck Ortman of Michigan, who gets down to the Green Bay 33. And there it's the same play in reverse order as Ortman takes the handoff this time, fires out to Shadnoy, who gallops across to put Pittsburgh on the scoreboard. Gary's kick is good, and now it's Green Bay, Pittsburgh 7. The Steelers come roaring right back for more of the same. Again, it's rookie Chuck Ortman striking through the air. This time he hits Val Jansetti, who goes out of bounds on the Packer 42. Fullback Franny Rogel cuts inside right end and powers his way to the Green Bay 29. The ball is given to Lynn Shadnoy on a handoff, and he fires a bullet pass right over the middle to Chuck Ortman, who is nailed on the Packer 3. On the next play, it's Lynn Shadnoy again going to his left to dive into touchdown turf for the second Steelers score. Packers 28, Pittsburgh 14. Seconds later, as Green Bay tries to move upfield, Jack Cloud muffs a pitch out. The ball rolls into the end zone, and Cloud recovers, giving the Steelers two points on a safety to make it Packers 28, Steelers 16. Pittsburgh, unable to move, sends Gary back to punt. He gets it away. Billy Grimes is under it on his own 30. He fumbles, and Lou Allen recovers for the Steelers as they threaten again. Chuck Watman provides a bruising sweep around end, good for a first down on the Green Bay 20. Michigan's Chuck Ortman, playing in his hometown of Milwaukee, is playing a whale of a game for the Steelers. Gets set to pass again. Val Jalen said he is in the clear and snares it on the six, where he is immediately brought down. On his third try, Fanny Rogel plunges across, and the end of the half sees the Packers' early 28 to nothing lead cut to a mere five points. Score now, Packers 28, Pittsburgh 23. As the third quarter gets underway, the Packers' Tobin Roth goes back to pass from his 20. He aims a short bullet pass into the left flat. It's intercepted by Jim Finks, who loses no time in galloping for another Steeler touchdown with the second half only 40 seconds old to put the Steelers in the lead for the first time, 30 to 28. Moments later, Joe Gary makes it Pittsburgh 33, Green Bay Packers 28 with a perfect boot for a field goal from 26 yards out. Johnny Michalos and Steelers are less than five minutes away from victory in the final quarter when those Green Bay Packers come surging back 
Tobin Road passes up to Don Moselle for a first down on the Steeler 11. Then it's Road again, lofting one over the line to Bob Mann, who zigzags across with a winning tally as the Packers come out on top to win with a last-minute score, 35-33, to in one of the most thrilling games of the early season. At Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, the Steelers, who lost a heartbreaker to the Green Bay Packers last week, get set for the invasion of the San Francisco 49ers, prospecting for a victory after their defeat at the hands of the Eagles in their last league tussle. The 49ers start things off with a bang as Jim Cason intercepts a Chuck Watman pass on his own 35 and scampers up the middle for 65 yards on a breathtaking touchdown gallop to put San Francisco out in front right from the start. The conversion is good and it's 49ers seven, Steelers nothing. Early in the second period, the Steelers bounce right back. With Pittsburgh on its own 23, Joe Gary winds up like a pitcher and hurls a long aerial upfield. L.B. Nickel nails it without breaking his stride and sets out for the goal line at full speed ahead. Over he goes for a Pittsburgh touchdown as the Steelers make it a tie game at 7-7. Another Steeler march dies on the nine and Joe Gary goes back and forth down to attempt a field goal. It's good and Pittsburgh leads San Francisco 10-7 at the half. After the second half kickoff, the 49ers explode into action. A Frankie Albert pass, it's Gordon Soltaw, and he's off on a 37-yard sprint to the Steeler 29. Albert, trapped, decides to run, directing his blockers as he romps 14 more for a first down on the 15. Then Jim Monashino knifes into pay dirt on a cross buck as the 49ers strike it rich to cop the lead. 49ers 14, Steelers 10. Seconds later, after recovering a Steeler fumble on the 16, Frankie Albert whips an aerial to Joe Perry on the goal line. Perry steps across. The kick is good. And it's San Francisco 21, Pittsburgh 10. Once the 49ers strike that touchdown vein, they work it for all it's worth. From his 22, Albert lobs a pass to Joe Perry, who gets to the 49 uh, before being brought down. Another Frankie Albert toss carries to the Steeler 29. And there, Pete Shabaram finds a hole in the middle and goes for 11 to the Pittsburgh 18. Several plays later, rookie Shabaram digs into the Steeler line again and comes out on the other side of the goal line. Score now, 49ers 28, Steelers 10. San Francisco gains possession at midfield on an interception. On the first play, Frankie Albert steps back, hurls the ball far downfield. Chuck Hortman cuts in in front of the intended receiver to intercept. And the amazing pro freshman from Michigan sets off on a dazzling run that winds up 59 yards later on the San Francisco 23. The bruising tackle puts Ortman out of action for the rest of the day. Several plays later, Ray Matthews makes Ortman's run pay off as he pitches to Lynn Shadnoy, who spins across. Joe Gary kicks, and the Steelers narrow the 49ers lead to 28-17. With time growing short, the Steelers drive hard to even the count. Ray Matthews goes back in the San Francisco 44. He lofts a high, arching pass downfield. Henry Menarek leaps for it, gets it for a 33-yard gain to the 49er 11. The game is almost over as Ray Matthews pitches again and hits Alby Nickel for a touchdown to conclude the scoring, and the Steelers lose by four points. San Francisco 49ers 28, the Pittsburgh Steelers 24. Municipal Stadium, Cleveland, Ohio. The Steelers of Pittsburgh, still smarting from last week's defeat, came out to meet the world champion Cleveland Browns on their home ground. The fourth play of the game calls the tune for the entire day. Cleveland's Otto Graham passes, Pittsburgh's Jerry Shipke intercepts, and laterals to Howard Hartley to set the Steelers up on the Brown 36. Lynn Chadnoy pulls through the line to the 28 as the Steelers move toward the Cleveland goal. Next, the ball goes to fullback Fanny Rogel. He cuts inside and rips his way down to the 11-yard line. 
to put Pittsburgh in scoring position. Then that old disease interceptionitis strikes the Steelers as Shadnoy pitches toward the end zone. Only to have Thompson cop the pass and bring it out to the six for the Browns. The Browns with plenty of room ahead of them and not much behind send Dub Jones blasting off tackle to lope all the way to the 44 where four indignant Steelers pin him down. The jinx hits Cleveland this time as Dub Jones fumbles, Pittsburgh recovers, and the march dies on the Steeler 40. The first quarter ends in a scoreless deadlock. In the second period, Chuck Ortman attempts to punt for the Steelers from his own 38. It's blocked. Horace Gillum scoops up the loose ball and steps across for the first score of the game. Round seven, Steelers nothing. Moments later, the Browns hit the road again. Emerson Cole races for 16 yards before bouncing off the sturdy Steeler on the Pittsburgh 37. Otto Graham decides to warm up his passing arm as he shakes off a bothersome tackler and flips a running strike to Dub Jones, who scampers to the 21. On third down, Graham pitches again. But a couple of Steelers are in the way, and the call goes up for automatic Lou Groza. Groza is set. The ball is up. It's good. And at halftime, the Browns are out in front. Cleveland 10, Pittsburgh nothing. During the second half, the two teams begin to exchange fumbles with as much gusto as they exchanged interceptions in the first half. Cleveland recovers the fumble by Ray Matthews on the Pittsburgh 29. On the next, Rex Baumgartner charges over guard for 11 and gets tackled by so many Steelers, there's no room to fall down. Then Graham's handoff is muff, and the Steelers take over once more, this time on their 11. The Steelers are set to move out on the arm of Joe Gary. He heaves. Warren Lahr leaps to intercept and sets sail for the goal line. Over he goes, and the Browns lead 16 to nothing. Lou Grosa boots, it's good, and it's Brown 17, Steelers nothing, and the Cleveland Browns of Mickey McBride take over second place in the American Conference. The Chicago Cardinals travel to Pittsburgh to tangle with the Steelers on the icy turf of Forbes Field. A bruising first half ended with a score deadlocked at 7 all. In the third quarter, the Cardinals and the speedy halfback gallops all the way down to the Steelers' 20-yard line. Again, Hardy drops back. This time, he angles a long aerial down the sidelines and into the arms of Fran Pulse, but skids out of bounds on the 10. Two plays later, Bill Cross takes the handoff, and behind a host of Cardinal blockers, he cuts through tackle and into the end zone. Score for Chicago. Cliff Patton adds the extra point. Cardinals take a 14 to 7 lead. Again, the Cardinals are striking goalward, but the threat is cut off as the Steelers' Jerry Shipke intercepts Jim Hardy's pass and races to the Cardinal 34 yard line. From the single wing, Chuck Ottman takes the snap, races to his right, and fires a perfect aerial into the arms of Alvy Nickel, who takes it all alone on the 15, and over he goes for the Steelers' second touchdown. Gary converts, scores again all tied up at 14 apiece. Late in the fourth quarter, the Cardinals' Jim Hardy takes to the air lanes, but his high wobbly aerial again finds the wrong target. This time, the Steelers' Jack Butler picks it out of the blue, heads up the sidelines and races for 50 yards, and a Steeler touchdown. Patton again converts to make it 21 to 14 Steelers. Moments later, Pittsburgh adds another touchdown, and when the final gun goes off, Art Rooney's Pittsburgh Steelers walk off with a 28 to 14 victory over the Cardinals. At Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, with United Nations veterans as their guests, the single-wing Steelers took on the Philadelphia Eagles in an all-Pennsylvania clash. 
Early in the first quarter, the Birds find themselves back to their own 19. And Adrian Burke punts out of danger. Pittsburgh's Howard Hartley takes it on the Steeler 44 and gets six yards into Eagle territory before he is stopped. Pittsburgh drives to the Philadelphia 29. Then Chuck Watman cuts inside end for 11 yards to the 18. With the birds refusing to give up any more ground, Joe Gary attempts. It's good. And the end of the first quarter finds the Steelers leading the Eagles three to nothing. In the second period, Burke passes for the Eagles from deep in his own territory. It's intercepted by Jerry Shipke, and he races across the goal line to make it Steelers 10, Philadelphia Eagles nothing. Now it's the Steelers backed up to their own goal line. Joe Gary punts, the ball bounces to midfield. Dan Sandifer scoops it up, puts on a classy performance as he carries all the way to the Pittsburgh 26. Two plays later, Burke steps back from the 22 and heaves a long one right where Bob Walston can snare it as he crosses the goal line and Philadelphia is in the ball game. Steelers 10, Eagles 7. Moments later, the Steelers are again forced to kick. This time, Gary punts from the 10. It goes way upfield, but that man Sandifer is there again to come loping back into Pittsburgh territory, moving to the 39. Burke takes to the air once more, spots Pete Pijos, and hits him for a first down on the 25. Burke sticks to the airways, and Pijos makes a beautiful catch in the end zone as the Eagles lead the Steelers at halftime, 14 to 10. In the third quarter, the Steelers begin to roll. Chuck Hortman back to pass, spots an opening, and races to the 47. On the next play, Lynn Shadnoy goes wide for a first down on the Eagle 41. But the Eagles won't budge, and again, Joe Gary provides a perfect placement to narrow their lead to one point. Eagles 14, Steelers 13. Moments later, the ball game breaks wide open. Burke passes from the Pittsburgh 33 intended for Walston. He can't get it, but the officials rule interference by Jack Butler of the Steelers, and the Eagles are on the three in spite of Steeler protests. Then Burke sends Van Buren crashing across the goal line to vault the Eagles into a 2013 lead over the Steelers of Pittsburgh. But wait. That isn't all. On the first play after the kickoff, the Steelers' Ottman fumbles. Jerry Cowig snatches up the loose pigskin and romps into pay dirt as the Eagles score twice in 30 seconds. Eagles 27, Pittsburgh Steelers 13. Late in the game, the Eagles pile on another tally as Burke passes to Sandifer, who turns in one of the best runs of the day, bowling over Steelers right and left and making the final score. Eagles 34, Steelers 13 to keep the Eagles in championship contention. There it is, fans, your Miller High Life football highlights of your favorite team in action. The Miller Brewing Company of Milwaukee hopes that you have enjoyed these thrilling films. And we hope, too, that you will continue to give your own home team your wholehearted support. Attend the home games. Be a season ticket holder. Talk up the team. And when you can't attend the games in person, follow the fortunes of your football favorites through the Miller High Life play-by-play -play reports of every game, both home and away. And so, until the 1952 gridiron season rolls around, this is Harry Wismer saying so long for now and reminding you that it's always a grand idea to enjoy life with Miller High Life, the national champion of quality. Miller. Champagne of fun.